I'm so excited about this month because we're talking about Jesus. And when I think about Jesus, when I focus on Jesus, I just get a warm fuzzy on the inside. And so I would encourage you, be sure and pick up your PFS, all you adults, um, because it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. What, what a great theme for this month. Pastor Dean's going to be preaching on it. We're going to be preaching on it in Kids Church, and I'm going to be talking about Jesus all the way through um, my time with Coffee with PK. So uh, I want you to know that, of course, as we all know, that that the the subject of Jesus is a as an endless subject. I mean, we could talk on this till Jesus comes. We could talk about him and all the miracles that he did. Uh, isn't that what the Bible says? I think John wrote it and he said, you know, he did so much that even all the volumes in the whole world could not, the whole world could not contain what he's done. I mean, there is just an endless amount of information on Jesus. And so today I'm not going to start with Jesus born in a manger like the picture depicts, but i I'm going to talk about the why behind the who. The why behind the who. That's the title of my message today. The why behind the who. And the who is not the World Health Organization that we're hearing a lot about. Uh, No, this is the who. This is Jesus. And, you know, when you just say that name... When you just say that name, that's what I tell the children. When things are going on in their life, if they will just get quiet, get in their room and say, Jesus, 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 then the peace of God will just envelop you. I mean, there's power in that name. We're not going to talk about that name specifically today, but we're just talking about uh, about the why behind the who. And I want to I want you to think about this. I want to ask you this question. Where would we be without Jesus? Like, where would we be? Where would we be? Well, we'd all be going to hell. And we wouldn't have available the abundant overcoming life. We wouldn't have the word. There's so many things that we don't even want to imagine ourselves without Jesus. And the thing about it is, there are so many people without Jesus that are going to hell that are going to spend a Christless eternity unless we tell them, unless we share with them the good news of the gospel. Because there is an abundant life available to us, but just knowing that, that hell is not for them, and we need to tell them that. You know, we need to do what Mark 16 and Matthew 28 says. We need to go into our world, wherever that is, your family, your friends, People at Walmart, if you go in there, wherever you go, tell people about Jesus. That's why we have or nights. So we can go into our world and tell people about Jesus, led by the Spirit of God. Because people need the Lord. People need the Lord. They do need the Lord. And see, the world doesn't see Jesus manifest in the flesh but they can see Jesus in you. And that's what we need to be. We need to be a reflection of Jesus and all that he did for us and all that he paid for. We need to be the light. I mean, that's what he called us to be, right? He called us to be the light and he called us to be the salt. So, you know, at these times with Thanksgiving, Christmas, when we're with family members that may not know Jesus like you do, that's when you can really shine. You can shine bright, not get in strife, not get in division, but walk in love and let the love of Jesus just flow through you. And I know in many instances, you have to bite your tongue a lot during this season with your family, but I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will equip you to handle it. So we, we call on Jesus, we call on the word. And so I want you to know that because you have Jesus, and I believe many of us do, then we've got something really special. We've got something really special, something that's supernatural, 
that we need to share with the people that we come in contact with. We need to let the world see Jesus in us. The world is seeing chaos. They're seeing all kinds of mess. And they need to see the peace of God, the love of God, the joy of God in us. And so we who are sold out to God just need to let let the love of Jesus shine through during this season especially. And I believe that people are going to notice something different about you if they haven't already. People that you work with, they're going to notice that, that you talk differently, you walk differently, you look differently. And it's all because of Jesus. You know, there are so many people whose lives is so consumed with religion. But this life, we know it, it's real. It's real. It's not fake. It's not fake. We're the real deal. We are the real deal. And so we're not hypocritical. You know what that means? That means one way on Sunday and a different way with your friends. We're not that way. We're the same. Just like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. What was Jesus? The same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, he's the same. So that's the way we need to be. We need to be the same wherever we are. We don't need to be hypocrites. That's what the world sees in many Christians, hypocrites. They act one way when they're with their church friends, act another way when they're with the people that they work with, the people that they're they're friends with, their family. We don't want to be that way. So, you know, Jesus said that in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure. You're going to have things that you have to deal with, like family, like situations. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Thank God that he's given us the power to overcome. That's why we need hupomene. That's why we need hupo mene. We need hupo mene so that our, we will have supernatural endurance so our light will shine bright and never go out. So we're going to read our scriptures. Scriptures in James 1, 3 in the King James. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then we know the literal Greek means says this, no, no, know this and never forget it, that the trying done by the devil to get us to cave in or proving, we prove the devil wrong, we determine this is not our end, we determine to prove that the word works, amen? amen. The trying of our faith is energized by endurance, the power to stand, the power to not waver or cave in or shipwreck our faith. And this is the time when we can shine. We can rise as cream to the top. Believers who believe the word, who stand in faith knowing that the word works. And we stand on the word. That's why we have to guard our eye gates. We have to guard our ear gates. We have to focus on the word and block out everything that is contrary to the word of God. Just like the Bible says, cast down thoughts and imaginations that exalt themselves against the word of God. So we're going to talk first of all about man's purpose. Man's purpose. We all know the story found in Genesis, but why did God create man? Well, God created man for fellowship. He created man as an object of his love. He wanted to express his love on mankind. And so he created man. So if you have your Bibles, turn into Genesis to turn to Genesis 1:28, which says, "Then God blessed them and said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the every living thing that moves on the earth." every living thing that moves on the earth. So man was given dominion of the garden, right? And everything in it that God had created, he was given dominion. Then in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, it says, then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, 
For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely do what? Die. die. You shall surely die. This was his kingdom assignment, his kingdom purpose that he gave man. This is what he told him to do. He told him to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and to do it and take dominion. Right. Say take dominion. take dominion. And it says over everything, even creeps. And then he told him, he put him in the garden and said, you tend it and you keep it. This was his purpose. You see, Man had a kingdom assignment. He had a kingdom assignment. And I want you to know that he created man with a kingdom assignment. That means that mankind had an assignment, a job to do, just like I read, that mankind was to fulfill. Do you understand? Yeah. Each one of you has an assignment. Yeah. A kingdom assignment that only you can fulfill. And you are created with that assignment in God's mind. Do you understand? So you're not a mistake. Do you understand? God knew you before you were even formed in your mom's belly. And he had an assignment, a kingdom assignment, something that only you could do. And he wants you to fulfill it. So you're very special. Do you understand that? You're no mistake. You're very special. You're very special to God. So basically, you have a very special part in God's global agenda. We've heard that verbiage a lot lately, the global agenda. Well, God has a global agenda too, that all the world will hear the good news of the gospel. And he created you a part of that to get that assignment done. You have a kingdom assignment. Amen? Amen. So, as Adam and Eve were in the garden... And we don't know how long the bliss was before Eve did her stuff. We all know what happened. So, I want you to understand that they walked in the presence of God every single day. They walked in the presence of God every single day. The Bible says, in the cool of the day, God came and visited with them. He visited with them, fellowshiped with them. And then that frightful day that their decision, and I include him in it too, changed the destiny of mankind. It was a sad day for all of us because Eve, led by her flesh, partook of the forbidden fruit. Now, a lot of people call it an apple. It wasn't an apple. It doesn't say apple. It says forbidden fruit. But we use that sometimes as an example. But it wasn't an apple. It was a forbidden fruit. And so she ate and then turned and gave it to her husband, Adam, who was right there with her. I believe they were inseparable. I believe that they, there was such a love that they had the love of God on the inside of them and they were best buds. That's the way marriage is designed to be. So let's read about the downfall. Basically, I'm going to read it. I don't think you have these scriptures. That's fine. You just listen. In Genesis 3, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? You see, the enemy is still trying to talk to you and get you focused on him rather than God. But the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. So we have, to, we have to be wise. We have to know, did that voice come from the Spirit of God or did that voice come from someplace else? That's why Jesus said, my children know my voice. 
the voice of a stranger they will not follow. How do you get to know his voice? You spend time with him. Right. You spend time in the word. That's right. So let's move on. But of the fruit of the tree, no. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now think about this. There were lots of trees in the garden. Yeah. But one, God said, don't eat. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. See, this is what the enemy does. He takes the word of God. God said, yes, you will surely die. And he perverts it. Oh, you're not going to get healed. I know it says you're healed by the stripes of Jesus, but you're not going to get healed. You're not going to get healed. You're not going to get out of debt. You see, he's negative nanny. That's right. That's right. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, what is that? When you go by your senses, right, right. it's called flesh. That's, right. that's why we want to be ruled by the spirit, not by our flesh. What we see with our eyes and what we hear. And I can just imagine her mouth was watering <laughs> as she looked at this forbidden fruit. You know, why is it that we always want something that is forbidden? You know, when you go on a diet and you're not supposed to have Cokes, that's when you really, really, really want a Coke. See, that's, that's the nature of the flesh. And we have to say, down flesh, I'm not going to have a Coke, or I'm not going to have that whole cake, or I'm not going to have whatever. Do you understand? That's why we have hupomene, supernatural endurance, to have power over the enemy and his thoughts that he's putting in our heads and power over our own flesh because your flesh is strong. That's why we got to get control over it. So it goes on to say, she saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. Weren't they already wise? But see, she believed a lie. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband who was right there with her and he ate. And then something happened. The eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Have you ever thought about what Jesus did with the fig tree? He cursed it. He probably remembered what they did. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Fear came in as a result of sin. When you're disobedient, what happens, and they were disobedient to God's word, God told them, gave them specific instructions, then what happened is they opened the door to sin. And then what accompanies sin is one of the things is fear. That's why you have to guard yourself to stand on the word. Second Timothy 1, 7, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Don't tolerate fear at any level. Fear of spiders, scorpions, fear of the dark, sleeping with the lights on, fear of the weather, you know, Pastor Dean has told you about how his mother was consumed with fear. So every time the clouds would billow, she would have him with her under the bed because she was afraid. That's, that's a horrible way to live. It's a horrible way to live in fear. That's right. 
and fear can consume you. But when fear comes in, guess what? The spirit of fear comes in. He brings other people with him, other demons with him. You know, my sister had such a spirit of fear that, that she was just, she just knew that somebody was in the air conditioner vent one night. She hurt somebody. You know how small of a person would have to be in an air conditioner vent? She was so convinced. And see, your mind can play games with you. That's why you take control of your mind. She called my cousin who lived in Las Cruces, which is what, 30 miles, maybe 70 miles from El Paso, to come to her house to check the vent because she felt like somebody was in there. I mean, there were so many locks on the door. Yeah. And she had an alarm. And so if I went out, <laughs> not forgetting to turn the alarm off, then of course the police are called immediately. I mean, it was, it was such a, 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 a just a, a yeah. oppressed yeah. place yeah. because of fear. Yeah. That's right. Fear will grab hold of you and consume you. That's why you have to nip it in the bud. Yeah. You have to say no every time or in every area of your life there's the, that's the least bit fearful. You have to stop it. Yeah. And how do you stop it? With the word. Right. With the word. So let's move on. Where was I? Okay. So when she saw that it was good for food, she ate it and gave it to her husband and they were naked and they were in fear. They were afraid because they were naked and they hid themselves. And he said, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. Now, the nature of the devil is to blame somebody else the blame game still going on today it's that wife you gave me lord she oh gosh and the lord god said to the woman what is this that you have done the woman said the serpent deceived me and i ate that's his business that's his kingdom assignment to deceive you into believing that this word is a lie, that you can't believe this. He wants to deceive you. And he doesn't want you to believe God's word. He wants to deceive you. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. That's why when you lie, what you're doing is you're opening the door to more of his buddies to come in. That's why I hate lying. I hate fear. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Note this, because we're going to get to this again. To the woman, he said, I will multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground for you, your sake. In, the to in toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth bring forth for you and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread he had to work see he had to work hard till you till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken and dust you are and to dust you shall return now i want you to see exactly what happened due to their disobedience they lost their power and they lost their authority, right? They lost their power and they lost their authority. They became a servant to sin. They became a servant to sin. And Satan was now their Lord and master. Satan was now their Lord and master. They became spiritually dead. 
They lost their identity. They were no longer ruling and reigning. They were servants. They were slaves. They were in bondage. They lost their physical life, the ability to live forever. See, if they had not yielded to the enemy, they would still be here to die today. We would say, hi, Adam. Hi, Eve. How's it going? They would be fully dressed now. They lost their destiny. They lost their purpose. They lost their kingdom assignment. And they lost their kingdom. So let me kind of explain it to you. Because I want to give you a visual. Because you have to understand why Jesus had to come. So you can tell people why Jesus had to come. Why they need to make Jesus the Lord of their life. So this is basically what happened, in, what happened in a visual. We have God and we have man. Can everybody see this? So God fellowshiped with man, male and female. He, he fellowshiped with them every day. Every day they were in the presence of God. Every day they were in the presence of God. That's a big deal. But then old snake face came in and that fellowship was broken because of sin. You guys, disobedience brings consequences. So sin, sin caused man and God not to fellowship every day. God wanted to fellowship with man, right? Yes. Man wanted to fellowship with God. Yeah. But there was a separation. There was a separation because of sin. That's why today when you sin, yeah. fellowship is broken. Yeah. yeah. So, God had a plan. God always has a plan. And so what he did was he sent his only son, Jesus, to bear the sin of mankind so fellowship and relationship could be restored. And when Jesus bore that sin and the results of sin, which is sickness and disease, poverty and lack, all the things that the enemy had perpetrated on mankind by the sin nature, which as a result of what Adam did and Eve, everybody born after them was born in sin. So you look at that precious little baby and it's a sinner. Really, we're all born in sin. You understand? That's why they cry all night. They could care less about your sleep. Right? So that's why you want to get them saved as soon as possible. Okay, so God had a plan. He had a mediator. He had somebody that could stand in the gap between God and man. So fellowship could be restored so that they could, mankind could be in the presence of God every single day. Yes. Every single day. Every single day. Fellowship was restored. God was happy because now he had that love relationship with mankind again. Do you understand? You were created by God so he could love you. And he does love you. He loves you regardless, regardless. And so we're to love him. And so we have the ability now to love like God loves because of Jesus, because Jesus came. So mankind, rather than have the life and nature of God, they lost that and they had the nature of the enemy. Rather than ruling and reigning, which was their kingdom assignment to take dominion, to rule and reign, 
they became subject to the dominion of Satan. Satan ruled over them. Do you understand? Because he's in the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. Rather than being spiritually alive, they were spiritually dead. And as a result of that, physical death took place in time. They could no longer take dominion, but they were dominated. I want you to see this. I want you to see this, that their destiny was one of misery, pain, lack, work, and their end result was hell. But God knew, God knew what he must do to redeem mankind, to restore mankind to the way he was before. See, sometimes we don't think when we do certain things. And when you do certain things, there is a ripple effect. It not only affects you, but it affects the people around you. It affects your younger brothers and sisters, your older brothers and sisters, your family. See, what, we don't live in an island to ourselves. So when we do things, when we sin, it affects others. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. Their sin, their disobedience caused the whole entire human race to be born in sin, to have the sin nature. That's why we don't want to yield to the flesh. That's what Eve did. She yielded to her flesh. She went by what she saw, what she felt, what she, she probably perceived that this tastes so good. She yielded to her flesh. I want you to understand that we've got to get control of our flesh. We have to say down flesh. I'm going to yield to the spirit of God. I'm going to yield to the word of God because there are consequences to disobedience and it not only affects you, but it affects others. Now I want you to just think for a moment what it was like for Adam and even Eve. They were in the presence of God every day and now they weren't. All they knew was sin. They knew God's provision. God gave them everything. They just had to go out and pick the fruit. But now they had to work by the sweat of their brow, the Bible says. They had to work hard. And they knew God's plan, but they didn't follow it. Right. See, this is God's plan. That's right. You have a choice. Deuteronomy 30, 19. God says, I set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. You choose. That's right, that's right. And they chose wrong, right? They chose wrong. Right. Suddenly, everything that they have, living in this bliss, living in this beautiful garden, they got kicked out. Right. They got kicked out. Suddenly, everything was gone because of their disobedience. One act of disobedience can change your life. Right. One act right. of disobedience can change your life. Suddenly, Adam and Eve were on the outside looking in. I'm sure they had some regret. Like, look what we have done. And I'm sure he continued to blame her. <laughs> it's your fault. And she said, no, it's your fault. You should have stopped me. So you can imagine the conversations. But God knew the hopelessness of the human race. He knew they were hopeless. Under Satan's dominion, you are without hope. You are without hope. Ephesians 2.12 talks about this. It says that at, at the time you were without Christ, you were aliens, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. Having what? No hope. People without God in the world today have no hope. 
no hope. They are hopeless. The Amplified says, remember that you were at that time separated, living apart from Christ, excluded from any part in him, utterly estranged and outlawed from the rights of Israel as a nation and strangers with no share in the sacred compacts of the mess messianic promise with no knowledge of or right in God's agreements, his covenants, and you had no hope, no promise you were in the world. No eternal life, just eternal death. Having no hope, no hope. This is the way people in the world are. This describes what the world looked like then and what the world looked like now, right? We've got government positions that are just like this, perfectly described. We've got neighbors, we've got family like this. No hope because they don't know Jesus. Jesus is our hope. They don't have hope, but they need to know. They need to have hope. They need to know the reason that God sent Jesus. And this is what God did. Familiar verse, John 3, 16. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. For God so greatly loved, I like this part, and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whosoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have everlasting, eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be safe and sound through him. God loved us so much. He loved mankind so much. He sent Jesus to buy us back. Jesus paid the price. He bought us back from the grips of Satan and Satan's dominion. Why? Because God loved us. He wants to fellowship with us every day. Fellowship with us every day. And God wanted to restore man to his original kingdom assignment. Yes. To rule and reign. Yes. To rule and reign. Let me give you this example. You know, I, I specifically said that man, Adam and Eve were given dominion. They were told what to do. Their kingdom assignment. They were given their assignment. Their assignment was to rule and reign, take dominion. That was their assignment. So we can use this book as an illustration of their assignment. And what we talk about in the transgression of what happened with Adam and Eve is we say that they fell, right? Yeah. They fell. So Adam and Eve, and Eve were at a place of authority. They had bliss. They had every need met. They were in the presence of God every single day. But something happened when they yielded to the flesh and they fell. Yeah. They fell. Mm -hmm. Mankind fell with them, basically. No destiny, no kingdom assignment living for the devil, which is what the world does. They wouldn't say I'm living for the devil, but they are. They're living for the devil. They've got the sin nature. All they know is bondage, following after the dictates of their daddy, lying, cheating, and stealing because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Mankind fell, lost. They couldn't pick themselves up. They couldn't restore them to the position that God had originally created for them to rule and reign, to take dominion, to be the head and not the tail, to have their needs met, to walk in divine health, walk in divine peace, all the things that we know were in the Garden of Eden. Every need met, every need met. So God's plan was to send Jesus to restore mankind. Listen to that word, restore. 
restore mankind to his original position. Ruling and reigning, yes. taking dominion. Yes. Now, didn't Jesus do that? I mean, when he walked on the earth, he showed us an example, cast out devils, raised the dead, healed the sick, multiplied the loaves and the fishes, did mighty acts, took dominion over Satan's works, right? Yes. This is what we're to do. We are restored. Thank you, Father. But what's the church? They're over here. Not where man was originally designed to be because we've got the church who's, how do you say it, acute Christian, carnal Christian, yeah. doing their own thing, consumed in their own lust, not caring about their neighbor next door, not caring about living for Jesus excuse me, and walking and talking like Jesus and being the light and being the salt. No, doing their own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Selfish. Yeah. Instead of taking the position that's rightfully ours yeah. as children of God, doing and following the example of Jesus. Do you understand? Go back to Genesis. This was God's original kingdom assignment to mankind. It hasn't changed. Right. It hasn't changed. Who's changed? We have. Yeah. Oh, we want to do those things. But we're living over here as a carnal Christian. Whatever it feels, whatever feels good, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live for self. That's not God's original intent. He loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us. Now, what you can do is you can read Isaiah 53, 1 through 10. And it talks about Jesus. It talks about how Jesus accepted the assignment and what happened to him as the suffering son of God as he came as a man. And it wasn't a real picnic. But yet he did it because he loved. He did it to fulfill all righteousness. You see, just like God loves you, Jesus does too. And you know, I love that song that, that we sing when um, Jesus was on the cross, you were on his mind because I believe you were, all of us were. He was thinking ahead. Instead of thinking, this hurts really bad. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about you and the kingdom assignment that God has given you to take control, take dominion, to live in the fullness, the abundant life. Isn't that what John 10, 10 says? the abundant life that he came to give you, it's all for us. See, Jesus came to bring heaven to earth. He wants heaven on earth. And I know many people in denominations, I know I was like that. You know, we sang that song, when we all get to heaven. It's going to be wonderful. Of course it's going to be wonderful in heaven. But God didn't want, just like we, the song that we played earlier, Jesus didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus came to bring heaven to earth. That's the kingdom that we're to be walking in on earth. There's no sickness in heaven. There shouldn't be sickness here as a child of God. Poverty, lack. Depression, right. no peace, no joy. Yeah. No. Right. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, emptied himself of his privileges, taking the form of a bondservant 
and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, because he was a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He said, God, I'll go. Daddy, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. I'll bear the sin of the whole world. I'll do it because I love him just like you do. God so loved and dearly prized you guys that he sent Jesus to die for you. John 10:17 through 18. Jesus said, "Therefore doth my Father love me." He knew. He knew that God loved him. Do you know that God loves you? God loves you. God loves you. Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Praise the Lord. 1 John 3, 8 clearly tells us that he came to buy us back from Satan's dominion. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that's what he did. He raised the dead, he healed the sick, multiplied the loaves and the fishes, cast out devils. And what does Luke 10, 19 say? I give you the power to do the same thing. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. But what did Jesus do in his earth walk? He demonstrated the love of the Father. I'm telling you, so many Christians have problems walking in love. Walking in love. But you know, he kicked the devil's butt. He hates the devil. Jesus hates the devil. And the devil hates him. The devil hates him. Because of what was prophesied, remember I told you to pay attention to Genesis 3.15, which said, The seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan knew from the beginning that someone was coming, born of a woman, born of a woman that would kick his butt. You know, that's why, that's why he had all the babies killed, remember? So Joseph took Jesus and Mary to Egypt. Protection. There's protection when you serve God. But Satan still tried to kill, kill Jesus. He worked through lots of people to stone him, to throw him off a cliff, all kinds of things. But Jesus said, we just read it, no one takes my life, I lay it down. I lay it down. You know, there was never a time in the life of Jesus that he didn't know his divine assignment. He didn't realize his kingdom assignment, his purpose and God's plan for his life. He even knew it at the age of 12, right? At the age of 12, when his parents found him in the temple, what was he doing? Talking with the rabbis, asking them questions, telling them a few things. See, you can know your kingdom assignment regardless of your age. That's right. That's right. You can know your assignment regardless of your age. We know overall what Jesus said to his mother. Mother, did you not know I would be my father about my father's business? Was he talking about Joseph? No. He was talking about his heavenly father. That needs to be all of your goals. I'm going to be about the father's business today. Every day. It's all about him. God, what do you want me to do today? I'm yours to command. Be about the father's business, not monkey business. Yeah, we have things to do. You know, we have jobs to go to, school work to do. But it can all revolve around Jesus. Help me, Holy Spirit. I studied this and I don't remember it. Help me. He'll bring all things to your remembrance. You see? You see what Adam and Eve did? They were in the presence of God every single day. That's God's plan for you. To be in the presence, not just Sunday, not just Wednesday night or whatever. Every single day. 
you walk and talk Jesus. When you walk into a room, people see, oh, you know, they said of Oral Roberts, Charles Neiman said this, he said he was on his board and he said when he walked into the room, there was such an awe, there was such a presence that surrounded him. Why? Because he had been with Jesus. Isn't that what they said about some of the disciples? They were unlearned. They were ignorant. But they recognized they had been with Jesus. See, when we're with Jesus, we walk and talk differently. We look different. So Jesus knew his goal. He knew that what he was supposed to do, he was supposed to pay the price at Calvary. He was supposed to get on that cross and die for your sin and my sin and the results of sin, which is sickness and disease. That same day he died for your sin, he died for your sickness and disease. Every despicable disease was put on him. Isaiah says his body was so marred, his visage was so marred, he didn't even look like a man. He did it for you. He did it for you. Why? Why did he go to all that trouble? So you don't have to sin, so you don't have to be sick. He did it for you. He was born to die. He was born to die. That's the greatest unparalleled act of love ever. He was born to die and he loved it. Peter, looking back at the cross in 1 Peter 2.24 says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Past tense. It was done 2,000 years ago on the cross. You were healed. See, you have to understand why Jesus came. The why behind the who. He came to redeem us from Satan's dominion. No longer are we slaves to sin. Sin no longer has a hold on us. Now we can open the door to the enemy. We know that. But sin no longer has a hold on us. The moment we prayed that prayer from the heart, Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord, be my Savior. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians, you can write this down, 517. And everything we did up to that point is wiped out. That's right. Wiped out. Forgotten. Your sin is put in the sea of forgetfulness. He remembers it no more. It's wiped out. Just like we get up here, race this board. I was telling the interns, we didn't have marker boards when I was in school. They weren't even created yet. Wiped out. We had chalkboards. But nonetheless, wiped out. Wiped out. Your past is past. Your past is past. And when you confess your sin, even today, that's gone. That's gone. Erased. Erased. We no longer are slaves to sin, but we're masters over the devil. Masters over the devil. He is under our feet. Isn't that what Luke 10, 19 says? We have power over all the power of the enemy. Jesus paid the price for you and me to be free from the dominion of sin and sickness, but also shame, shame, guilt, poverty, lack, and every despicable thing that the enemy tries to put on you or has put on you. You're free. So that we could experience the opposite. So that we could have freedom in Jesus. So that we could have peace. We could have joy. We could have love. We could have forgiveness. Isn't that what John 10 10 says? Y'all could all quote it. He said, Jesus said it himself. He says, I came that you might have life. 
and have it more abundantly. Yes, when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, we get to go to heaven, but we're not going to heaven yet. We are, have a kingdom assignment to bring heaven to earth and not only experience it for ourselves, but to let this lost, dying, hopeless, Satan-driven world know the good news of the gospel. You have a kingdom assignment every single day to be about the Father's business. Every single day. Will you accept your assignment? Will you accept your assignment for yourself to get your act together? Because people are going to look at what you say and what you do. They're going to look at your actions. Really, before they listen to your message about Jesus. But when you think about Jesus, you should get a warm fuzzy. Because he did so much for us. He did so much for us. God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die for you. And that's our assignment. We have a kingdom assignment to live for him. He died for us. We live for him. Is that too much to ask? I don't think so. 